Hello, everybody. Okay, we um, will probably just wait a little bit for people to trickle in. Hi, Suzanne, we're just waiting a few minutes for people to trickle in. <laughs> I haven't been caught yet. Hi, Annabelle. It's nice to see you for the face to the name. Suzanne Sullivan, I see you. Hi, Jolyn. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. Are you good. actually in the office today? Oh, yeah. I'm in the office every day. Dude. I know. It actually is really good for this extroverted person to actually be in the office. Yeah. No, I definitely I get that. Um, although it's been definitely like a learning curve to it's been exciting to be around people again, but it's been a learning okay. curve to be around people again. Um, hi, everyone. I think we'll get started and people can trickle in as they can. Um, I am Annabelle. I am one of this year's UW Combined Fund Drive campaign assistants. Um, and here at the UW CFD, we're really excited to be able to continue this lunch and learn process. Um, the world is crazy right now, as we all know, um, but we feel it's so important to continue to be able to provide a space um, for UW staff and faculty um, to be able to learn about our amazing nonprofits in Seattle and um, everywhere, pretty much. So that being said, uh, we are going to try and do questions at the end of everybody's presentation today, and if you feel you might forget your question, uh, go ahead and throw it in the chat and we can hopefully get to it at the end. Um, all right, so today our Lunch and Learn will be focusing on young adult homelessness. Um, as anybody who is living in Seattle would know, homelessness is a huge crisis um, that people experience every day. And with the weather getting colder and wetter, um, it's really something that needs to be addressed. And thankfully, we have some amazing people here today to talk about how their organizations are addressing that. And um, a few weeks ago, we had a lunch and learn focusing on homelessness in Seattle in general. And we felt it was necessary to create a space that really focuses on um, our youth and our young adults, um, because they are experiencing it just the same as adults. And honestly, it might be even scarier. Um, for kids to be couch surfing and such, not just kids, um, young adults. 
Uh, that being said, um, let us kick it off. Our first speaker is Jared. Um, he is the executive director for Roots. So Jared, whenever you are ready, I think you should have screen sharing capability. Uh, great. Uh, thank you all uh, for having me here today. Really appreciate it. I'm going to warn you that I've had technical dif difficulties all morning and I am extremely grumpy. Like I am mad. Uh, I don't know why I don't deserve internet. Um, so I'm glad I found internet in time to be here. Um, and thank you very much for being here. I think I can get through this not being grumpy. Um, I will jump into my slideshow. Uh -huh. Do you folks see the, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm going to assume people can see it. So yes, I'm with Roots Young Adult Shelter. I'm Jared Klaus. I'm the executive director. Uh, I've been at Roots for uh, nearly two years. So I've, I've been here, I, I had like a two months head start on the pandemic uh, and we have been busy um, renovating a new building and moving and surviving a pandemic um, during my tenure. It's been educational to say the least. Um, so for folks who don't know um, what Roots is, we are an emergency overnight shelter. Um, <clears throat> so really when you think of the spectrum of community, I'm sorry, spectrum of um, homeless services on a, like a continuum, we really operate as the emergency room. Uh, and, and so I think there's a lot of conversations about, you know, what folks ought to be doing uh, to end homelessness. And uh, a lot of times people forget that, like, when you don't have a place to go, that is the most important question. Um, and we are here to answer that, to make sure that anyone who doesn't know where they're going to be um, can confidently know that they will be inside and safe tonight. Uh, so we have 45 beds. We serve folks that are 18 to 25 up until their 26th birthday. Uh, we have meals, laundry services available, showers, uh, and case management. We also have um, like creative writing group. We have an art group. Um, we, and, and we also have like guest feedback sessions. Um, yeah, this is this is the basic basics of who we are and what we do. Um, we are obviously in the U district. We're like half a block from the, the, the main campus. Uh, just north of it. We've been around for 21 years. Uh, for our first 20 years, we were in the University Temple United Methodist Church. Uh, and two years ago, uh, we found out that that space was sold uh, for redevelopment. And we had to find a new location. And um, <clears throat> as we were fearful of closing down, a community member came forward and offered to sell us uh, this old frat house. Uh, so last year, we've been renovating it to get it ready for us to move in. And we have been moved in ever since March. Um, a plug I like to just something that truly makes us unique besides being, I think, low barrier and like that emergency room is that we really do have a volunteer driven model um, that um, I think is one of the best volunteer programs in, in the city. Um, and I've worked at a lot of nonprofits. So I say that with, with uh, not just talking to make us sound good. Um, so I'm really excited. Uh, I could talk about this forever, but I will try to not. Um, I think that Roots truly has a unique opportunity right now. Um, so to actually not only continue doing this day-to-day -day work that we are doing to make sure that young folks have a place to be, but I think we have a unique opportunity to like actually attack the root causes of homelessness in the US. Um, and, and forgive me, I couldn't help myself but use the pun for root cause of homelessness. Because um, really in, in America, we have homelessness because of a, a national values deficit, not because of a resource deficit. Uh, that is not true in all countries, but here it, it truly, truly is. Um, I spend more time um, arguing the facts that we already know than I often get to spend on solutions. And it's exhausting and infuri infuriating. And we have the knowledge and the data and the resources to make this not a reality, um, but it's the, the values deficit that keeps us from being able to realize that. Um, and that values deficit is really the, the belief system in America where some lives are valued more than others. Um, 
And this is something that infuriates me all the time. Generally, service providers like Roots, we are focusing on the symptom, symptoms of the problem and not the root cause of problem. So like we are trying to get people food and hygiene and a place to sleep. We are not looking at the systems of oppression um, and, and the broken systems that are allowing people to fall through the cracks. And I think we have a unique opportunity to address both of those here. Uh, it starts with Roots uniquely. Uh, we are, I would argue uniquely dependent on volunteers to do what we do. Um, and so really, I would say of any other program in Seattle or the county, <clears throat> we not only uniquely identify with the community, we are also uniquely dependent on the community to do <clears throat> what we do. Um, like it's so much a part of our identity that two years ago when we did not know where we were going to be, and we had the option to either move out of the U district or close, the agency thought it was, we were so connected with the community that we didn't feel like we could be roots if we weren't part of the community. So this is one of the unique opportunities, our unique uh, dependence and identity with this, with the U district. Um, we are, we are in the middle of Greek row. We are a house full of young adults surrounded by houses with, uh, full of young adults. Uh, so it's young adults surrounded by their peers, uh, and also these Greek systems, and I, I, I know the Greek system is probably complicated, but at the core of, of a lot of their values is community engagement and volunteering, which very much plays into our vision and what we want to do uh, with our impact in the world. And lastly, we are half a block from a world-class um, institution. I mean, and, and to be honest, I, mean, I got my undergrad and my graduate degree at UW, so I might be biased. But we know that we have world-class programs in, in, in the medical field and non uh, in um, you know, mental health, uh, social work, uh, public health. Like we have a built-in partner half a block away. Um, and then this is the thing that really gets me excited is I think uh, when you look on at uh, how do you want to focus your impact? And I think a lot of people who are interested in change struggle with do I, have a local impact or do I have a global impact? And I think being part of the U district in which you have thousands and thousands and thousands of students coming and going every year by having an agency uniquely dependent on community, we have an ability to bring in folks um, that are here during while they're getting their education, get a different um, vision and understanding of what poverty and homelessness looks like and really change the hearts and minds of people um, that get to that they could actually change the value deficit that we have as, as a country. And then they get their education and they leave and they take that experience and they take that passion and they take that new understanding of poverty and homelessness and they take it back, in, take it back with them into the world. So we have a unique opportunity by focusing on our own community and doing this the best we can here at home. And then by nature that will have an impact on the world on a larger scale. I get so pumped up about this, I, I could do this forever. Here is our new building. This is actually before the renovations. Uh, it's really exciting. It's 18,000 square feet. Uh, it's only seven blocks from the church we used to be in. Um, and the exciting piece is that we um, can continue doing emergency shelter in this space, but we have the space to not only be the emergency room, but we plan on opening that top floor to have both like a supportive living program, which is one of the most research models in the nation and works amazingly, particularly with folks with high barriers. Um, we also have space to include medical um, professionals on space, mental health, um, employment and educational assistance. We just need, we are in the middle of a capital campaign to raise those funds to do the second phase of renovations and really make this really a community center when, where everyone and anyone in our community can find, um, can find the resources they need. Um, and it's also, I just love, I think I, I will just point this out. I think people are like, how dare you have a shelter in Greek Row? And I, it's the most logical place. Uh, Greek Row has been supporting young adults uh, living in this space for over a century. Uh, and like, this is exactly where we ought to be. It's a community where young adults have been living and being successful for, for literally over a hundred years. If you're interested in supporting us, um, you know, we, we are looking for donations, both for, for our operations and also the capital needs of this new building. Um, 
Uh, we also uh, you know, take in-kind donations, uh, which you can find on our website. We have volunteer oppor uh, opportunities, which you can find on our website. Um, and then most importantly, what you can do is just be informed. It's help me not fight uh, folks who just dismiss the facts that we have amazing uh, data on uh, the impacts of the lack of affordable housing, the impacts of having housing first models, the importance of having trauma-informed care. Um, and so when you hear those narratives, disrupt them, um, because we could really, the change is going to be in how we see and view this problem and our ability to take action based off of it. I want to invite you all to next week. We have our virtual uh, event. Um, it's Rise Up 2021. Uh, we'll have some musical performances and some speeches and uh, some really cool videos. And if you have any questions, this is how you can contact us. So I think that's it. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, we were lucky enough, a few of us, um, to go actually visit the new root shelter in the Greek system. And it was, oh my gosh, it was amazing. Huge. So, so much stuff there. It was awesome. Um, okay. Next up, we have Suzanne Sullivan, with, who is the uh, Chief Advancement Officer of Youth Care. So whenever you are ready. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm a little techno technologically challenged, so hopefully... Y'all can see that well. You got it? All right, great. Um, so, hi, my name is Suzanne. I'm the Chief Advancement Officer for Youth Care, which is a somewhat confusing way of saying I oversee fund development, communications, and advocacy. And I'm happy to be with you here. Um, we are huge fans of University of Washington and so appreciate all the ways that you partner with our young people and in support of our programs. Um, so, I want to acknowledge. Um, that, uh, that this meeting and all of Youth Care's program sites reside on the land of the Duwamish people who have stewarded this land for many generations. Um, and we stand in solidarity with the first peoples of this land um, by paying rent to real rent. Um, if you're unfamiliar with realrentduwamish.org, please jot it down and check them out. They're doing some really incredible work in support of our indigenous neighbors and community members. Um, so things you'll learn today, why youth experience homelessness, who they are, what youth care does to help um, young people, and how you can get involved. And I'm going to talk really swiftly so I can do this in eight minutes, so apologies in advance. So we'll start with the mission. Youth care works to end youth homelessness and ensure that young people are valued for who they are and empowered to achieve their potential. So youth care started in 1974 as the very first um, homeless shelter for young people on the West Coast. And today we have 16 different program locations and 19 different programs supporting youth within them. Um, so why are youth homeless? homeless? This is a uh, simple question with a complex answer. So first, it's important to recognize that no one grows up wanting to be homeless. Um, the young people that we meet are navigating uh, life's dynamic circumstances um, and they all want a chance to stabilize and to thrive. Um, second, every young person comes to youth care with a unique story um, and an, in, an individual set of circumstances. And behind those individual stories are common systemic barriers and inequities. So for example, on an individual level, we often see young people coming into youth care um, because of situations involving family conflict, abuse, neglect, rejection, substance abuse, mental health issues, et cetera. Um, however, those individual circumstances are part of some systemic impacts um, rooted in centuries of colonization um, and slavery um, and perpetuated over time through institutionalized racism and poverty. So additional root causes um, include um, the affordable housing crisis. I mean, I think the most recent uh, stat says you need to earn $80,000 a year to live in Seattle. Um, as, a, as an individual person, and that is pretty stunning, especially for an 18 year old with no job that is on the streets. Um, and we can also point to root causes of homophobia um, and underfunded public systems of care, um, which exacerbate family crisis um, and homelessness. So how many youth are homeless? How many, what do folks think? How many youth are homeless in King County? And I think that Jared might have touched on this. So I'll jump right into it. So it's a thousand young people in King County and 4.2 million within the US. But I wanna make a note about this. This thousand um, 
this thousand young people um, is from the point in time count, which is at one night in January where volunteers go out into the streets and count people in public spaces and folks in shelter um, and drop in centers are also counted. So youth do a really great job of staying in the recesses of our community and protecting themselves. So I would say we should triple this number. Um, so saying at least 3,000. Um, that count doesn't adequate, adequately capture um, young people who are couch surfing or staying in congregant situations with each other and making, um, making ends meet. So um, the point in count is point in, time count is great, but really doesn't tell the full story. So youth are at greater risk of homelessness. Um, those young people are um, significantly BIPOC, which is Black, Indigenous, and persons of color. So um, the institutional racism that we have mentioned before, this is, this is um, evidence of that, that that's at play. Um, two other um, factors that also uh, correlate to rates of homelessness is a lack of a high school diploma, which is connected to employment specifically, which is then connected to stability, and also um, report a household income of less than $24,000 a year. So when you think about our low wage earners, that's within that group. Um, so what do we do? So we provide um, a comprehensive range of services to help young people experiencing homelessness um, achieve long-term uh, stability. So I'll walk through each of these real quickly. So shelter and housing. Um, we have shelter services for young people who are ages 20, 12 to 18. And then we also have services for young people who are ages 18 to 24, and we call them kids too. Um, <laughs> and those are either overnight shelters or up to 90 days. And then we work with young people in our shelters to connect them to more stable um, housing environments. We also have community living, which is more of like congregate housing, where you might have 10 young people within a home with on-site support services. And then we have independent living, which are young people who are paying rents maybe with a housing voucher or something like that. And then they have, connect, they have contact with case management on a, a regular basis. We also have engagement. So we like to call um, our centers engagement centers because we're working to engage young people in meeting their immediate needs and their basic needs, and then connecting them to support services that they need. So we have um, the Orion Center, which is at the corner of Denny and Stewart um, in the big green building. Um, and we serve young people ages 12 to 24 in that building. We also have the University District Youth Center, which is nestled up um, by University Congregational in the U District, also serving ages 12 to 24. And we have the South Seattle S Shelter in Rainier Beach, which serves young people ages 18 to 24. And all of these engagement centers also incorporate street outreach to connect young with young people in the community, let them know that we are there as a safe and reliable resource um, for them. Um, so education, as we mentioned before, high school um, completion is really critical to achieving stability. So we, that's what we focus on here at Youth Care. We partner with Seattle Public Schools um, Interagency Academy, and we um, root uh, education programs within our existing programs. So we have an interagency academy at Orion Center, and we also have one at Casa de los Amigos. Um, which Casa de los Amigos, um, I forgot to mention, um, provides stability for, um, for undocumented young people ages 12 to 18. Um, so we also uh, provide bilingual education programming um, for our Casa de los Amigos Uno and Dos sites. Um, and we also have a Youth Build GED program, um, which is in partner with, partnership with South Seattle College, serving young people ages 18 to 24 which is in um, one of our employment programs, um, which is the next piece. So Youth Build uh, connects young people, provides training um, and, uh, and guidance to enter the construction industry. Um, we also have the Tile program that provides um, opportunities for healing um, and connection through creativity. Uh, we have the Barista Training Program that helps young people um, develop skills to uh, to become baristas in our very coffee-centric community. And we have a customer service programming as well that helps 
young people prepare for um, retail positions and other positions where there would be um, forward and community facing. Um, so participants in each of these programs are provided a minimum of $15 an hour during their training. Um, they receive a certificate of graduation upon program completion, which helps to build their resume. Um, and they receive ongoing support to gain employment in their fields. And then we also have specialized services and early intervention. So this is um, to provide emergency and real-time based services to young people. So safe place, those, those great yellow yield signs that you'll see on your Metro bus and your Starbucks, et cetera. Um, we manage that program to provide, to connect runaway and homeless youth service, youth, young people to services in real time. It's a 24 seven um, kind of hotline and we can uh, dispatch a case manager within the hour to that site. Um, we have the Bridge Collaborative that provides support to youth experiencing labor or sex trafficking or sexual violence. Um, we have school-based services for young people who are not in our programs, but maybe experiencing homelessness or instability. Um, and that's in partnerships with Seattle Public Schools. And we have detention-based services that provide support to young people who are involved in the juvenile justice system which also juvenile justice system and a disproportional rate of BIPOC youth experiencing homelessness go hand in hand. Um, and then family services. So we can uh, provide family re reunification where appropriate and also provide support to families that have young people within our age demographic that might be experiencing some instability. Um, so our impact. So we serve about 1500 young people a year um, we uh, shelter over 700 young people, and we have 185 young people living in our community um, in independent living programs. And we have um, connected 280 young people in our employee training programs. Um, and our drop-in centers, um, we've engaged almost 1,000 young people. Uh, we are deeply supported by the community. Um, when we were open for volunteering, which I'll get to that in a moment, um, we worked with over 1,700 volunteers, over 8,000 volunteer hours served, um, almost 40 individual fundraisers hosted by supporters, um, and over 50 volunteer group projects completed. That's deep cleaning, that's painting, that's um, you know, helping, helping us create really uh, beautiful home environments that our young people can really thrive in. Um, and over 90% of our meals um, at Orion Center were served by volunteers um, pre-pandemic. So I wanted to kind of touch on some of the COVID impacts that um, our programs and young people um, have experienced. So with COVID, I mean, it's, it's a challenge. How do, you, how do you keep a young person safe when your guidance is uh, wash your hands and they're living on the streets? So we kind of started there and we've had to reimagine most of our programming for this period of time. So we had to transition all of our programs into a shelter in place model, which meant that we took some people who were doing face-to-face -face and had them cover 24-7 sheltering situations where we didn't have 24 seven programming. We were super nimble and super flexible, added new locations, um, expanded others, um, and even transitioned our program locations to meet social distancing requirements. Um, our volunteer support became remote. So that 90% of meals, our, our staff were doing that, or we had some folks like Expedia, and some individual volunteers who would drop off meals, which we are deeply grateful for. Um, we had increased expenses, client assistance. If, if Metro's down, how does a young person get to an appointment? By a lift. So that was like the safest way. So, you know, those are additional expenses. PPE, computers, if someone's engaging in education programming, how are they going to do that remotely? Um, and hotspots, so they would have Wi Fi. So, all of those pieces to be really nimble and keep young people moving forward. Um, and there a lot of the, the community spaces for young people shuttered. So libraries, community centers, all of those places that young people on the streets or even it, experiencing instability rely on were no longer available. So that was a real challenge for those, for those young people. And many of them returned to unsafe home environments and are just beginning to return to services right now. Um, 
and there's been a lot of fatigue. Our staff, I just want to hold them up. They have worked tirelessly to find creative solutions to keep a safety net in place for young people. And I can't speak highly enough um, of their ingenuity and their commitment and dedication. Um, and it's really just, I'm just very proud to work with them. And I, I always want to lift that up because it's often something that people don't necessarily mention. Um, but we are energized by our young people um, and we're really excited to be able to do what we do and we feel privileged to do that. Um, so five ways you can help, actually six, obviously giving, donating supplies or hosting a drive, providing a meal or volunteering, hosting a virtual event, advocating with us um, during the legislative sessions and connecting with us on social media. Um, we, it, that's a good way to field if you have any questions and such, and then we can disperse you to the right folks. Um, so I know I spoke very quickly, but I wanna thank you for your time and, and hearing about youth care and the work that we do. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, that was, a yeah, that was perfect. So perfect. Um, a really great introduction, honestly, to just the whole topic. Um, so thank you so much, Suzanne. Okay, um, next up, we have uh, Channing with um, New Horizons. She is the volunteer coordinator. So whenever you are ready. Hi, everyone. I know on my on Zoom right now, it says I'm Jaworan Coles. I'm not. It's actually someone from our engagement services team that I guess I just kind of hopped on uh, his Zoom. So my name is Channing. I am. So I have previously been the volunteer coordinator. Um, I just took an offer in development. So now I'm the development coordinator. I'm actually filling in for Brie today. Um, I've been here since uh, August. So I'm actually fairly new. So it's really great to be able to meet all of you and be able to hear your amazing stories of what your organizations are doing right now. So um i'll share my screen i am also a little bit technically challenged in this let's see okay can we see it okay um so like i said my name is chaining i am the development coordinator here with new horizons i work with most of our donors i work with putting out our newsletters and um getting our media up and running um, so kind of some of the history of New Horizons, we were founded in 1978. We exist because every day thousands of young people are forced to be without a home in King County and New Horizons provides support to over 600 young people between the ages of 18 and 25 who are experiencing homelessness annually. After growing steadily over the past 40 years um, and moving locations for you used to be in Capitol Hill, now we're here in Belltown, um, pretty close to Second Street where all the restaurants are. Um, we've been here since 1998 and we serve young people at our center each day. Our opportunity is to disrupt the cycle of homelessness for young people offering safety, shelter, case management, education, employment, and housing with support before homelessness becomes chronic. So our mission here at New Horizons is to end homelessness one young person at a time and our, that supports our vision of ensuring all young people have access to a stable home. Um, a stable home can mean staying with a friend, it can mean finding low income housing, it can mean finding um, support with family, um, just as long as you know we consider all those stable homes. So during every Monday through Thursday, we have day programs, which is access to basic needs and support, housing and employment services, behavioral, mental, and physical health care. We have case managers here. We serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day. Um, we have services targeting social and emotional development. And of course, we foster a sense of community um, in that, you know, all of the young adults here can kind of just, it, it, it provides a safe space for young adults just to gather and socialize and hang out in the space. Um, you know, we have programs like art classes, we have um, cosmetology stuff going on, we have nail salon care, we have um, people that come in and volunteer their time to do haircuts here and hairstyling. Um, so just a well, well range of a bunch of programs here during the day. At night, we offer our Cedar Street Shelter, which is a 30 bed low barrier shelter that provides safety and stability every night. We have 24 beds that can be reserved for young people, um, which leads to a greater consistency. And the remaining five, six beds are open on a nightly basis for walk-ins to people who maybe it's their first time 
guarantee, you know, the first time staying in New Horizons. We do guarantee if it's your first night staying with New Horizons, you are guaranteed a bed. Um, at the net, so we have our nest shelter. It's currently not open right now, but we're planning on opening that very soon. We had to close it down just due to short staff and because of COVID. Um, but it is a 12 bed transitional shelter that offers more permanent housing for some of our young adults here. Um, there's high quality support for our vulnerable youth who are actively working with case management to address their unique barriers to housing and employment. It is most commonly utilized by individuals with greater barriers to housing, mental health needs, and those with higher privacy needs. Um, these are mostly people that come from the LGBT community or people just wanting some more stability while they work directly um, we're focused with case managers. Um, like I said, it's not open right now, but we're hoping to get that up and running very soon. So some more case management here, our case managers, our housing navigators, our diversion specialists work with youth to remove barriers to independent living. Um, our case managers partner with youth to secure housing referrals and placements, establish identification, link youth to mental health counseling and addiction treatment and medical services. Our housing navigation team will secure housing for 200 youth in 2021. That's what we're projecting. And in 2022, we're actually projecting double that. Our apprenticeships here at New Horizons, we do offer apprenticeships, apprenticeships um, or internships. Um, our employment is an essential part of existing homelessness and is the most frequently requested type of support among youth and young adults experiencing homelessness. So approximately 68% of our homeless youth and young adults are unemployed and face barriers to employment, including education, identification, confidence, and stability. So some of our apprenticeships we offer here is with Street B, which is our attached coffee shop. Um, we host about three, we have about three in, uh, apprentices that will be working in Street B, helping, you know, with roasting the coffee, learning barista techniques, um, and just daily upkeep of the shop so that um, they can go on and pursue careers um, in the service industry if they like. Um, some of our other apprentices work directly with the programs, which is opening up the shelter, um, assisting with some of our art programs, serving meals, serving lunches and dinners. Um, some of our apprentices also are on laundry duty. It's just tasks that upkeep um, the facilities um, to make more of a team effort. Um, so yeah, so we offer the paid work experiences, um, teaches soft and hard job skills, provides one-on-one -on -one mentoring and support to find for more permanent uh, employment. So even after their apprenticeship is over, we'll help them to secure that next step of a more permanent job. Um, so I kind of went over, you know, we have the street bee, we have the hospitality and we have our facilities. Um, I went over all of those. Um, ways you can get involved in New Horizons. So our volunteering, we have um, several opportunities right now. Some of our big opportunities are with our meal services. So um, we're currently about to start opening up lunch services to our volunteers. Right now we have, um, we do lunches every day, but it's run mostly by staff. Um, but we're about to start opening up to volunteers to take over. But right now we have all our volunteers do our dinner services every night. We have two, three, really three different types of volunteers. We have volunteers that bring a meal and serve it. We have volunteers that will cook on site and also serve it. And then we have our server volunteers who are volunteers um, in the event a group wants to just simply drop off food. We have server volunteers who are open to receiving the food and make sure it's served out to all our young adults. Um, some of our other volunteer programs are with our direct service and youth engagement. So we'll have volunteers on site who sit, you know, or who are open to sitting in the space and connecting with some of our young adults, maybe offering up some employment services, helping them build resumes, helping them create LinkedIn profiles, helping them with job searches. Um, some of our volunteers are also helping them try to secure housing. We also have volunteers who come into the space and assist in board games. And just like I said, more of a presence to just hang in the space and be present. Um, connect with youth who are, who are wanting to connect with someone of maybe a mentor, like a peer mentor program. Um, we also have volunteers who are here to help with the programs like art programs. Um, they provide board games or even um, do, we have a salon that volunteers with some of our haircuts and more of our cosmetology volunteering. 
Um, you can also make a donation. Our in kind, these are in kind or, or monetary. Um, so our in kind, we are currently accepting donations of clothing, um, everyday household items. We actually are in the process of building um, welcome home baskets. So we are accepting donations for baskets of, you know, just like a welcome home kit where you can include towel, hand towels, cleaning supplies, kitchen supplies, anything that would make moving into a new home a little bit more easy to transition to and more welcoming. Um, this We host a clothing drive where we have mostly churches will come um, and they'll provide just, just a ton of clothing for us to provide to the young adults. Uh, this clothing is used for everyday just cool clothes or even interview clothes, which is really, really supportive for young adults who don't have interview clothes and need something more professional to wear. Um, and if you have any questions, reach out to me. My email is chaningc at newhorizonsministries.org, um, or you can reach out to Bree Voigt, who is the Director of Development. Channing, thank you so much. Um, and everybody here who is attending, um, if you feel so inclined to create any kind of um, drive or you would like to donate, uh, your coordinators should be able to um, help you with that. And um, Kate and Camille on this call would certainly be happy to help you figure out how to get your goods to one of these awesome organizations. Okay, um, next up and our last speaker who's going to get a little bit broader um, on the topic of homelessness and still stay within um, Young adult homelessness is um, Isabel. So Isabel is the development specialist for community engagement at HopeLink. Um, Channing, I think you might have to- I'm trying to figure out how to stop <laughs> the share. Oh, wait, here we go. I think I did it. Oh, perfect. Thank awesome. You. Okay, Isabel, whenever you are ready. Okay, thank you. Let me share my screen. everyone see this one? Okay, good to go. Okay, so um, I'm with Hope Link. My name is Isabel. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm really happy to be here with you today and um, hear about all the other amazing organizations who are supporting our community. Uh, Hope Link works mostly in the East King County area. So what that means is, um, and I'll go to our next slide because it goes into I'll go to this one real quick. This goes to all of our service centers. So we have service centers at Redmond, um, Bellevue, Snow Valley, Carnation, Shoreline, Kirkland. So everywhere kind of above that, we don't go much farther than Everett, but anywhere in that area. We also have our mobile food banks and some mobile areas that go out a little more rural. So that's where we serve. And those are the communities that we serve. So at HopeLink, our vision is to have a community free of poverty. So I always like to say we're trying to work, I'm trying to work myself, we're all trying to work ourselves out of a job. We don't want to have to exist anymore. We wanna be able to support people enough that there is a community around us that is free of poverty and no longer in need of our support. But we're not there now and we're working towards getting there. So our mission is to promote self-sufficiency for all members of our community. Uh, we help people make a lasting change in their direct life, um, something that they can build and have for a long time. So we have several programs and what I'm gonna move through is each of our programs and I'll give some insight into um, our data for who, uh, how many of people we serve who are between the ages of 18 and 24, 18, 25 uh, age range. So we have food assistance, we have financial assistance, we have transportation services, we have energy assistance, we have financial assistance, adult education, family development, employment services and housing services. So HopeLink uh, offers a lot of services. We want to be able to say that like, you come to us for food and we can help you in all these other areas. Any support you need, we want to be able to give that. Um, so that's what we're striving to do. And I'll start by saying too that uh, the demographics of what we work with. So about 7% of the clients that we have at HopeLink are between the ages of 18 and 24. And that's probably around uh, 1,800 to 1,500 people every year we serve who are between the ages of 18 and 24. And uh, in total of all ages, uh, five to 10%, it's usually somewhere in between there, of clients that we serve are experiencing um, houselessness. So that's again, between like 1,000 to about 500 
um, people kind of divvies between those two are experiencing um, houselessness and use our services. So I'll go into our food program. Uh, this is a COVID um, change that we've had to make, but we've been distributing boxes. So we usually have our grocery store model. So when you co go to a Hopelink center, each of our center has a food has a food center. Each of our centers have a food center, and um, we have a grocery store model. So you walk in, and it looks like a grocery store, feels like a grocery store, and you shop like you would at any grocery store. And since we have since COVID, since March of 2020, we shifted to creating boxes and having people come up and then we give a cart full of uh, shelf stable good box, meat, cheese, dairy, eggs, produce, hygiene items, and we just kind of give them a cart and then they can go to their car from there. Uh, we are excited also to announce that we're gonna be shifting back to our grocery store model. Yay, I'm super happy. Um, in January, so sometime in the new year, we're hoping to be able to move back to our grocery store model and our food centers because we are very proud of it and we know that it is, helps to reduce stigma. Um, so we are excited about that. So on average, we produce about 2,439 boxes per week, which you can equivalent to that many carts are distributed per week. Uh, that are full of all the other uh, food that we distribute. And so on average, about 2 million 500,000 uh, meals. Uh, and then these stats are, I should say, are from January up till now um, of this year. And yeah, I think that's everything for food. Oh, I'll, I'll make a mention too. Like I said, we have mobile market. So that's like a mobile food center and it's a big van with a cooler and we drive out to more rural areas. Think, you know, Duval, Carnation. Um, Bothell's not that rural, but we don't have a center there. So our mobile market actually goes to UW, Bothell, and Cascadian campus. So if anyone there wants to utilize Hopelink services and receive some food, we do go to the UW, Bothell. So, um, and we love being there. And another thing that we do, well, I'll get into this other part later. So we'll move on. Another area that we have is air energy assistance. This is very popular in the winter months, as you can imagine. So you can come to us and say, I can't um, pay my heating bill. I need some help and uh, Hope Link will give you funds for that. We serve about 4,602 households so far this year. Financial assistance, um, as you can imagine, is an area that has increased substantially in the last year. This comes to like rental assistance. If you can't pay your rent, come to Hope Link and we may be able to help you. So we've provided, we've distributed more than a million um, dollars to 851 households to help with different things. One would be mostly rental assistance, but if you need anything else in your life that you, you know that you need to be able to be self-sufficient, come to Hope Link and we may be able to help you. So we raised our maxual, maximum annual total assistance per household to 3000 in September. And we increasingly have to do, do this as you can imagine because rent can get more and more and more and more expensive and just life expenses get very expensive, especially where we live. So 3000 can be distributed per household in, um, annually per year. We have our housing department. We have housed 221 families. We have two housing centers. One, this is our picture of our one in uh, Avondale, and we also have one in Shoreline. And uh, the average length of stay for people in each house is about two years. We only house families. So to utilize our housing services, you have to have a child. Um, and so typically we house between the ages of like 20 to, you know, until 60, I say. Um, and 89% exit our housing to have housing stability. We also have a family development program that's kind of working. It's a broad title, but it's someone that you can, you can be given a, a Hopelink employee will work with you to help develop your family and make it stable. So if you need to talk about, you know, five-year plans, 10-year plans, where you want to be, goal planning, and how we can help get you there, uh, we can get you with a case officer and, um, and help make you self-sufficient, stable, again, reaching towards our mission. So we're really happy about this stat, but 100% of households um, since January of this year exited with stable housing. Another area we serve is employment. So we've had about 170 uh, clients use our this service in the last year since January. Uh, we've had 39 job placements. We have an average wage per hour up to 1839. And we provide resume services, um, uh, mock interviews, anything we can to support you. Uh, a lot of our services, I should mention, 
have gone digital, as you can imagine, during COVID. So typically, you'd be able to walk into any Hopelink Center and say, I need help in this area. And there's a case manager there ready to help you right away in any of these areas. And now we're fully online. So if you need help, you can go on our website and then we'll be able to meet with you online via Zoom. We have adult education. This is an area where we work with a uh, demographic between 18 and 24 range. So we have a high school uh, GED um, education service for people who are 21 and up. And we've served about 63 people, probably between 60 and 70 um, students a year for that. And they graduate with their GED. And we have an English for work. That's also, we have, I think about, let's say 7% of people who use our English for work uh, studies are also between the age of 18 and 24. So if you uh, need to get that diploma of English for work, that certification, I should say, we can do that for you here at HelpLink. We have financial capabilities. This is kind of like having a financial planner, helping um, make sure that you are stable in your income and in, in um, all the areas regarding finances in your life and help you be self-sufficient. So eventually you don't need to have a case manager. So we have uh, 40, uh, 74 participants we've coached in the last year and have financial consultations. We also house workshops via Zoom as well. So transportation is our second, or probably our second or almost largest department of HopeLink. We have a really big um, partnership with King County Metro. So a lot of the bus drivers who drive the DART buses, all the bus drivers who drive the DART buses are HopeLink employees. And uh, those DART buses are the bus, I don't know if you ever see them, but they're the purple kind of orange, smaller buses, and they have King County Metro on them. And those buses are owned by HopeLink and operated by HopeLink. And they're the buses that can kind of go a little off their route. So you can go on the website and you can say, I need you to pick me up here. My neighborhood is close to the route. So they'll go off the route, pick you up and then go back on their route. So they kind of, they have the ability to go off and on their route. Um, again, just goes to the overall mission of you know, if you don't have transportation, Hopelink can help give you transportation to where you need to go, especially in the more rural areas. We all know our transportation is, um, you know, we need different partnerships to help make it better, especially in rural areas. So we're happy to have that partnership with King County Metro. We have um, non-emergent medical transportation and other transportation. So if you need to get an appointment to a non-emergency non medical appointment, so if you need to get a COVID-19 vaccine, if you need to go to a doctor's visit, if you need to get dialysis, we have um, HopeLink employees and buses who will go and pick you up and take you to your appointment. If you need to be released from the hospital, um, we can also pick you up there and take you where you need to go. So we provide that as well. Yeah. That would be going over all of our departments. Um, it goes faster than I think. I hope it didn't go over time, but that's all the areas that HopeLink has for support, supporting the community. And again, I'll say about 7% of the people that we serve are between the ages of 18 and 24, and about 5 to 10% of everyone who we serve are experiencing houselessness. I can also add with our um, program that we're excited to be kind of rethinking and redoing. Um, is in our food department, we have these things called e-bags. So they're called like emergency bags and inside of them, they always have uh, food that doesn't need uh, assistance. So it doesn't need a microwave. You don't need a can opener, things like that. And so we always have e-bags ready at all of our facilities and even on our mobile food banks, I'm pretty sure. So if anyone comes into a HopeLink Center needing food immediately and our food bank is closed or you know, whatnot, we are able to provide them with uh, an emergency e-bag, which will have just a bag of all the essentials um, to help until our food banks open the next day. So that's what we have also for that. And, oh, I also wanted to add a partnership we have with another university um, at Bellevue College. Another area of education that we have is we're able to teach people how to use transportation systems. So if you're new to the area, and I know, we all know transportation can be difficult to learn how to navigate. What bus stop do I get off on? How do I get on the bus now? Where do I scan? Do I need to scan? Different buses do different things. Um, so we train anybody who needs knowledge in how to um, use the bus system, we can come to Hope Lincoln, we can help teach you how, we can do ride-alongs with you and, and help you feel self-sufficient to use the bus system on your own. And so we have, uh, we have a lot of students from um, Bellevue College who uh, utilize HopeLink for this service. So we go to Bellevue College and we have this session where we teach 
students how to use the bus system to get to, to Bellevue College. I think the setup, it's nobody's living on campus there. So everyone has to commute in. So we provide that service as well. Okay, so how can you support Helpling? I'd start with all the information I just gave you about our services, share it. If you have someone uh, in your neighborhood, in your direct uh, you know, family, friends, who you think could utilize Helpling services, we are here for you. So we're here to help you in any way we can, any support. I always say, you know, getting food from Hopelink could save you, you know, $400 a month. And with that $400, you can put it in your savings. And with that savings, you can build it and you can become self-sufficient for whatever dreams you want to build, getting a house, being able to pay your own rent. Um, that's kind of what Hopelink's here for. So if we can help you build yourself up and not have to be living paycheck to paycheck every month, that's what we're here to help. And also break down those stigmas. We, we're all about that. We don't want, when you come to Helpling Services, we don't want you to feel, um, there's a lot of stigma, especially around food banks and, and utilizing any social services. And we just wanna help break those down. It's, it's, we're here for you. There's no stigma with it, no strings attached, and there's nothing wrong with utilizing services. Uh, volunteer, we do have volunteer opportunities, especially right now to pack boxes. So that's something you could do, easy to find on our website. You can go to volunteer and then you can sign up for a webinar to get trained and then just start volunteering. Um, you can support our current campaigns. So we have different needs right now. You can do a fundraiser. You can donate, donate monetarily. You can, um, right now we also have a stock the shelves initiative for that exciting news I had for January because we're gonna reopen the food banks to grocery store models. We need to fill all those shelves with food at each of our five centers. So we are in need of in-kind uh, food support so if you're interested in that, you can always reach out to me um, and or reach out to your partners and they can get you in touch with me. And um, yeah, so any way you want to support, I'm always here. Uh, you can always give me a call or let me know. Um, and I believe that's it. That's just a big thank you. Here's a picture of our staff saying thank you. This is our Redmond Center, um, but I appreciate having the time. Isabel, thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, and of course, anybody who would like to get in contact with our speakers, you can go through me. Um, everyone should have my email now because I pester you all. <laughs> um, okay, uh, if we have any questions, we absolutely have time for that now. And I just wanted to say thank you again to all of our wonderful speakers and the work and energy you put in every day. And thank you to everybody for attending and just giving um, these great organizations the space to tell you about what's going on. So yeah, if anybody has questions, you can unmute um, now. Um, this is just a question in general for everybody, but um, in terms of, I'm kind of curious in terms of everybody's needs and supplies, like what sort of things have you needed unexpectedly in terms of, I don't know, food or things that you might need? And in terms of people power, do you need more general volunteers or do you need somebody like more specialized experts, um, especially since COVID's been kind of wandering around? I can go first real quick. Uh, I would say for Hopelink, we've had, um, there's lots of different areas that's been weird on the supply chain. Since we haven't been accepting donations, we've been purchasing our food. One thing that's been hard to purchase has been um, diapers um, and uh, what was the other one? Oh, a toilet paper, of course. So those are always areas that we are in need of. And, um, and the second question was, oh, volunteering. Nothing super specialized right now that we need, but we do need, you know, people to help in our food banks, which is always just fun, easy assembly line work right now, or being able to distribute food to clients right now, since we don't have our grocery store model up, we need a lot more people to help with those every day, so. Gotcha. Neil, I can also share that um, we're definitely in need of of meals, um, prepared meals uh, for small groups or larger groups um, to be dropped off on sites. And we actually just um, uh, came up with a procedure. We are opening our volunteer service back up um, fully. Uh, we're requiring vaccinations, um, which I know UW is familiar with. Um, <laughs> But so we're excited to get that going. So all of those opportunities um, to be with young people um, in special socially distanced spaces and meal service will be available. And it is 
rainy out and terrible out. So any like rain ponchos, hand warmers that we gear up for the cold weather, um, anything that keeps young people out of the elements. Um, we've got masks, but we can always use more um, to keep young people safe. About 50% of our young people are vaccinated right now. We're working really hard to increase that number. Um, so those would be probably the biggest need are meals. Um, and then also we'll be sending out kind of a reopening of our volunteer program. So all sorts of opportunities. Yeah, I'll, I'll hop on that. We, we also need food, specifically breakfast stuff, individually prepped uh, breakfast stuff. Also, uh, we tend to go through more socks and underwear during the cold season. Um, and um, as far as volunteering, it's not particularly specific skill sets. I, we, we, have need, we have need right now for prep, which is in the afternoon. So like prep shelter, supporting shelter in the evening, overnight shifts and morning shifts. So if you just have free time between like 6 p.m. to like you know, 9 a.m., we have something for you. So thank you. Gotcha. These are all things that my coordinators might be interested in. So thank you so much. Uh, sorry, I interrupted. Go ahead. Right, right. I was, I'm going to hop on, you know, what Jared said too, and uh, that actually brings up a great way of breakfast items. We um, not only breakfast items, but also uh, volunteers who are willing to come in during the early mornings. I know we have a, a good base of volunteers who are wanting to come in in the evenings, but we're currently trying to find volunteers who are well, who are willing to come in in the morning and start doing breakfast services. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, food, breakfast, also volunteers, um, more volunteers who are willing to kind of do like a peer mentor program or just volunteers who are willing to drop into the space as a direct service volunteers. We're always looking for volunteers who are willing to help out with employment services, housing searches, um, job searches and resume building, stuff like that. Gotcha. Thank you, that's lots of good information. We're almost out of time, but if anybody has another question, feel free to ask. Hi there. I just have a really quick question around um, just kind of citizen etiquette, etiquette. And, you know, if I'm on the AV and someone is asking me for money uh, versus, you know, should I just, is, where's the line, right? I want to obviously have my safety, but I also want to be helping out. And I and be, you know, I give donations to, I think all of you guys at this point, um, but, when I'm facing it, what what is the best way to do this? Well, I can share that you can send them right over to that little yellow house off of 15. Um, okay. UDYC. Yep, yep. Uh, we've got open door policy. They can come on in, they can get a meal or something like that. Um, uh, so I would recommend to do that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I want, I would say that say that like, recognize this is a personal comfort and safety thing. And just so uh, as I'm kind of speaking for myself, I, I do think Suzanne's spot on that if you feel comfortable having access to resources, whether that's a, a card or a flyer and being comfortable with directing folks, I will say personally, I think the um, concern about safety is overstated um, in our in our community. And so I, I would state in general, it's not a safety risk. Um, um, and I, I'm not, that's not to shame anyone based on how we talk about poverty in our community. Um, and what I do personally, just because I am around folks who in need all the time, I have chosen rightly or wrongly to never carry cash. And um, if I generally am near a store, I will ask what someone could need. And that has been so eye opening. The amount of times I've bought milk or laundry detergent um, or bread, uh, it, it really is just a tiny window into what people really are asking for instead of our deepest fears of you're going to do something bad with this or you don't deserve this so that's what i've chosen personally and that's a great question and i would just piggyback on what jared was saying and just kindness goes a long way people walk by young people all the time and don't acknowledge them and so even just engaging them looking them in the eye and saying i'm sorry i don't have any money but you know, whatever that might be a resource or, you know, but I hope you have a good day. Something as simple as that really does go a long way. Thank you yeah, so much. I, I would just add to um, that and totally believe in everything that Jared and Suzanne said, I would reiterate all of it to the fullest. I would say exactly what Jared was saying too, is if, especially if I'm on the street near a grocery store, near 
anything. I, I always say, I'm sorry I don't have cash on me, but I'd love to, do you have a list of things you need? Let's go shopping together. And I take them shopping. Or if we're near a coffee shop, I'm like, do you want to sit and have a cup of coffee? I think just what Suzanne was saying too, kindness, restoring any sort of, you know, dignity, going again with that stigma of, of not, you want everyone to feel human, everyone worthy, everyone worth, you know, everything that we're all worth. So I always try to extend that if I have the time. And, and I will, just the cherry on top is um, recognizing that even though folks are in need, recognizing they are just humans. And that sometimes if you offer someone like a cup of coffee, like you just walked up to me randomly and said, hey, you have coffee, I'd be like, Leave me alone. So that's not inherently for folks experiencing homelessness. That's just humans. Like, oh, okay, who the hell are you? So, yeah. What a perfect uh, question to end this lunch and learn on um, and perfect answers. Thank you all so much for being here and for participating. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, thank you all for participating. Um, it's these are such a joy and I learned so much and I really appreciate you all um, and then this will be recorded so if anybody wants to share it out um, let me know and I can send you the recording or it's on should be on our YouTube at some point. All right everyone um, have a great rest of your day. Take care everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Thank you all. Amazing speakers. <laughs>